the Mac Observer's Mac Geek app, episode 766 for Monday, June 17th, 2019. Ah, greetings, folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek app, the show where we take your questions, your tips, your cool stuff found. We mix them all together so that each and every one of us, every week when we come here together, gets to learn at least five new things. This is not a challenge. It's a privilege. It really is. We, we, we're so lucky to be able to do this. We're so lucky to have. It's a promise. It's a promise. It's true. We're so lucky to have Clear on board as a sponsor at clearme.com. Uh, and we will talk about, uh, talk about that. Actually, you can go to clearme.com slash Mac geek. Yeah, but I'll, we'll talk all about that URL in a little while here because there's a story behind it for now here in Durham, New Hampshire, as usual, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in fearful Connecticut, as usual, this is John F. Braun. How are you today, Mr. John F. Braun? Fantastic. And I had a fantastic weekend as as you probably did as well because it was Father's Day and Yeah, we did um, I'm appointed I'm okay. appointed the host of our father yearly Father's Day celebration. So, you know, I had to power wash the deck and get the grill going and buy the goodies, but uh a good time was had by all and we didn't get rained on because there was predictions of of nasty weather. Oh yeah. Yeah, it rained here. It all was day. good. Yeah, yeah. We had a nice day on Saturday. I actually had a gig Saturday night and then uh, for Father's Day, the four of us went to uh, an escape room in Portsmouth and and did a escape room challenge. Those are a blast. If you've never done one, I highly what? recommend it. It's so much fun. Escape rooms? You, you escape okay. room? Yeah, right. I I think I know the story in general is that it's like you get locked in a room and there's a challenge. You got to find clues and and stuff to get out of the room. Otherwise, you, so, you die of. a horrible death. I'm yeah, sure yeah. that's not part of the. You don't get package. you don't get locked in. Um, but but yeah, you have to solve these puzzles together. In fact, I did one at WWDC. The one at WWDC was a 15 minute one that was just for um, uh, it, it was, you know, themed. In fact, it was you have to save the keynote. Right. And so there were these puzzles that you had to do the, the one at, which was awesome. It was really well done, except it was really hard. And they are I've done very, very difficult ones before. And. We have always made it through them. The one at Dub Dub, we I did not. Um, the group that I was with did not, and we, um, you know, we got hung up on one puzzle that we just couldn't get past. But the interesting part about these escape rooms, and I and I, I think there were only a few groups that succeeded at the one at Dub Dub DC, um, and one of them involved. Um, well, Kelly, actually, Kelly Gamont was part of one of the groups that, that <sighs> succeeded, it, which doesn't surprise me because I have found that you need to have people that think differently from one another to to solve these puzzles. Or if one person gets stuck on something, somebody coming in and with a completely different approach to it is often the way that you get through it. And that's why it works out really well for our family. When we did our first one, um, you know, Lisa even said, she's like, oh, well, Dave and Lucas are going to solve all the puzzles because those guys like solving puzzles and nothing could have been further from the truth. If it weren't for having all four of us there, including Lisa and Sky, there's no way we would have made it through because everybody's looking at it differently. And and that was my that was, you know, our problem with the one at WWDC. It was it was five. I think it was just five of us. There should have been eight, but there were three people missing. So there were five of us and we were all you know, guys that think like programmers and, and techies. And so it, there was, there was no one at that critical moment to say, Hey, so here's a different way of looking at this problem. And, you know, and that didn't happen. And so we just, we just, you know, spun our wheels and ran out of time, but, um, but it was fun. It was, and it was a very well done one. And we of course got out of the one on, uh, on Saturday with about four minutes left. So um, we were in the one on Saturday for an hour. Or just shy of an hour. But yeah, really, really well done. We went to one, one in uh, Portsmouth called Monkey Mind. So if you're local, they do a really good job there. Um, so I don't know. And who doesn't love monkeys? I agree. I agree. Uh, all right. I, I have a quick tip to share because it was actually triggered by a listener who was asking me how to get the High Sierra installer. And uh, my... 
my advice to all of you is go download a full Mojave installer now while it's still really easy to do that. And you don't have to scour the Internet looking for weird links and questionable sources. The Mojave installer is available if you're running Mojave. You go to the app store, you go into you don't even have to go into purchase. You can just search for Mojave, say get it will open up software update and then software update will say, hey, do you want to redownload Mojave 10.14.5? And if you say yes, it will download the entire six ish gigabyte package and put it in your applications folder and then it will launch it. Don't run it. Quit it. Copy it to, you know, your cold storage somewhere. I put mine on my disk station and then it's there. And now I don't have to worry about it. And even if you already have one from like when Mojave came out, because many of you probably do this as a matter of course, like me doing it now, you get 10.14.5 in the installer, not 10.14.0. So that's good if there are have been new machines released or certainly you just get all the patches. It sort of saves you the um, the headache of of having point zero. So, yeah. So go do that before it's before it's too late. You do that too, right, John? You you save installers and just put them on your disk station or whatever. Uh, I'm looking right now when I'm bringing up the list here. So I, I would like to make a comment. Um, all right, I got to put in the password again. Um, but the thing is, yeah. So I have installers almost back to like the early days. Um, one thing to note, and I have to go through my installers, is that. Uh, to secure them, there's typically some sort of certificate embedded in the installer. And the problem is older installers, the certificate may expire. So you may want to, as my colleague suggested, uh, download a newer v- version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, the other thing I can mention is that you can trick, sometimes you can trick an older installer by setting the date back to the date before the certificate in the installer expires. And of course, the last solution is, hey, if you want access to all of the operating systems, you get yourself a developer account for 99 bucks a year, at least. I think that I think it's still there. Do they still have them there? Yeah, I, I haven't I just looked. got my update notice. Yeah, same. Yeah. I as far as I know, update. the developer program, will. I, I think you could actually get 10.0 if, if you wanted to. The thing is, for developers... Um, I mean, eventually you have to abandon older OSs, but um, of course but they make them all available just in case you want to support them. So yeah. Yeah. that's the other go. thing. But yeah, the, but no, so you reminded Ki- me that Kiwi I should look Graham through mine. But Kiwi Graham in the chat yeah. room has two tips. Uh, the first is he says, be careful with the Mac OS downloader if your disk space is limited, because it may just download the tiny installer that actually does the real download during the process. So make sure you got the full six gig thing. The download progress bar in the software update preference pane of Mojave will tell you how much it's downloading. So that but yes, the great tip. And then Kiwi Grimm also says, and I'll put this in the show notes, he says, use the command date space 02010101116 to trick certificate checking. So I will put that uh, right here in the show notes. And of course you can get the show notes delivered directly to your email box. If you like every single week by signing up for our Mac Geek uh, weekly newsletter. So I will put the link to that in the show notes. I realize that's slightly self-referential, but if you just visit MacGeekGab.com, you can sign up right there and, uh, and you get the, Everything. You're all good. And of course, Dave mentioned our chat room, which is at MacGeekGab.com slash stream. Correct. Yeah, man. All right. Uh, on to Mike. Mike has a nice little tip talking about OS versions. He's talking about the beta versions. He says, with Apple's even stronger warning over trying out beta software this year, I thought I'd mention something I do to stop myself from getting caught. If you're lucky enough to have a spare device, an iPhone, an iPad, a Mac uh, on which to run the beta software and you have an iCloud family account with a spare slot for someone, then when you install the beta OS, create a new iCloud account for it and add that as a family member. That way it gives you access to all your apps without the danger of mixing your live iCloud data with beta iCloud data. Uh, and that's not a bad idea. I've never heard of problems with that, but you know, hmm. like eh, I and I and I don't think it costs you anything. Well, 
It doesn't cost you anything to to get a family account unless you have Apple Music, in which case it it. Well, no, you could buy just a single Apple Music account for your for your main. You don't have to assign that. So even like for someone like you, John, you could just turn your account into a family account uh, and 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 you should be good to go based on everything I can think of here. So yeah. but I'm the only one here. Why would I do that? Because of what Mike just said. No, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and actually, I like the suggestion of using a separate iCloud account if you're using beta software, because what does beta mean? Some people think it means, ah, it's just, you know, it's not shiny and, uh, you know, pretty and stuff like that, but it could destroy everything. And I'm not kidding you people. It could. Because I've yeah. done software. Beta software could munge your data. So rather than having it munge your production data, like your, all your, the stuff that you have in the in iCloud. I mean, I don't want a beta destroying all that. So no, uh, no great suggestion. Yeah, it's good. I like it. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, Joe has a, a good uh, a good point here with all the summer construction projects coming up. He says, uh, you know, we talk about wiring everything when you uh, when you have the walls open before you put the sheetrock up because you know e ethernet is very inexpensive to run then as soon as the sheetrock's up it gets a lot more difficult and a lot more expensive so joe says i've been selling new homes for a local home builder for 19 years i can tell you with absolute certainty certainty that you will never predict what type of wire you need and where you will need it in the future that is true he says since it's commonplace in the, in the northeast to build on top of basements he says i have an empty electrical box installed at normal outlet height with two inch electrical conduit stubbed to the basement for future wiring. It gets covered with a blank outlet cover. So it looks pretty and is left for future use. He says this can be done throughout the house and run to both first and second floor rooms. I also do this with a substantially larger chase from the basement all the way to the attic, which will allow a customer to get above or below any problem in the future so that they don't get caught you'll also find this far cheaper than placing cables uh which you may never use throughout the house that's really interesting yeah so just doing two inch conduit put it everywhere and then you can you know run cable wherever you want that's, that's not bad that's smart i like that idea it opens up your options always look to the future you know i remember this dave remember at home yeah of course. That offered uh, cable modems. Yeah. I, I remember one of the things. So one, I was an investor for a while, though that Sorry. turned out too well. Yeah. <laughs> well, along with all the other people that thought they were geniuses when they bought stocks during the tech boom, and then all of a sudden they crashed. And mm -hmm. It's like, whoops. But um, but I remember one of their strategies for, for deploying, uh, you know, most of it was fiber backbone. But they did one thing that kind of echoes this thought here is that from what I recall, along right of ways, they would run not one, but two tubes. So one yeah. tube would have their fiber and the other tube was, well, for whatever's coming next. Smart. <laughs> and it's like they didn't know. Now they had other problems, um, right. but but still it, it was interesting. It's like, let's just put an additional pipe next to this pipe. To look towards the future. Smart. So. I like it. So kind That's of like here, idea, it's man. like yeah. always, a, you know, try to over engineer your solution. Hey, you know, put in That's what we do. Cat seven, put in cat seven. Yeah. You, but then you'll, you then you'll want, it, then you you'll want fiber, it, you know, whatever. Like yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Paul has All a, right. a good tip. Um, he says uh, it regards to a problem he ran into recently when he migrated from using the one password app uh, that he had synced with Dropbox to the agile bits cloud for one password. He says, uh, I've been using the app for about 10 years and have nearly 2000 entries. He said, I love one password, but I wasn't uh, entirely happy that uh, the, the subscription service doesn't enable users to do their own backups as is possible when you're using Dropbox sync. So I like this. The, the, hmm. He's heading down an interesting path here. He says, uh, no one likes to get caught. And I don't care how sincerely any cloud provider says they're backing up my data. I like to be in control of this myself. I know other people feel similarly because one passwords forums are full of examples. He says, so my solution for using one passwords cloud while simultaneously having a local backup is as follows. Uh, even though a person is using their subscription service uh, hidden in the vault settings, is the ability to set up a standalone vault, one that is local to the Mac. What I've done is, in addition to my cloud vault, 
I, which I now use to sync between my devices, I've created a standalone vault into which I've copied all of my one password subscription synced data. I put this standalone vault in a folder in Dropbox, just like I had done previously, uh, in addition to syncing with Dropbox, which gives me another cloud backup of sorts. Uh, the Dropbox folder syncs with an old iMac or an old Mac mini that I use as a server that's hooked to Backblaze. He says, uh, so there you go. So he's got multiple backups. He says, for that real belt and suspenders option, I use Hazel on my Mac to automate copying the standalone vault located in Dropbox into another folder that I've created in iCloud Drive. So he's really got everything going. Uh, and and the only issue with this is that he has to remember to go into one password and copy any new or changed entries. I guess he could just select everything and copy it over to the Dropbox vault and or to the local vault and it would it would just replace the ones it needs to. But it sure would be nice if there was a way to automate this um, and really just to have a local backup like that. That would be the key. So maybe uh, well, maybe I'll, I'll I'll send this segment over to the one password folks. Maybe there's. Maybe there's an easy way or maybe there's a good reason why they 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 don't do this. But um, but I, 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 I grok your. Uh, your concerns, Paul. Yeah, you don't want to you don't want to lose your passwords. Does, does you use LastPass still? Is that right, John? Do, do they? Do and I was any? researching this. <clears throat> oddly enough, I was researching this as you were mentioning this and I found an article. Oddly enough, not at LastPass, but. The title of the article is Where is my LastPass vault data stored locally on my computer? Which I think is the gist of what we're talking mm-hmm. about. Now, oddly enough, this article is at logmein.com. I don't know why. Do they could, own LastPass? The did, they, did they buy LastPass? Is that right? Did they? I, I, maybe they did. <laughs> yeah. Last I don't know. Pass, I can't last pass joins. They, they, they purchased LastPass in 2015. Okay. Well, I have an article, uh, which I just told you the title of, and it shows you where it is stored locally. So um, that's something people want to know. So I will put that in our lovingly handcrafted live show notes. Sweet. Cool. Um, The uh, the I looked at the one password data and I found where it's stored, but I I don't think it's in a format. It's in a SQLite database, um, but I don't think it's in a format that would be. I think it's possible to extract from it in in an emergency, but not in a simple way. So it'd be nice to have a simple way. So, so John, I have a uh, a tip for you. Um, go up to if you have the uh, you know the Amazon A Lady devices in your house. Go mm-hmm. up, go up to one of them, and instead of saying A Lady, uh, you know, turn off the lights, say A Lady, turn off the lights. And it will say to you, if this is the first time you've done that, whoa, did you just whisper at me? Would you like me to whisper back at you when you whisper at me? And you can put it into and you can turn on what's called whisper mode and whisper mode will reply with a quiet whisper if you whisper at her your uh, command. So so there you can be in the uh, comfort of your your own home, whispering sweet nothings to the A lady. Pretty cool. I've tried this with uh, with the S lady and dude. the G lady. Yeah, dude, that's really cre- it, it's kind of creepy. It's getting a bit too personal. It, it's it <laughs> when it whispers back at you, it's really creepy. Like it, it's yeah, yeah. But it but it makes I mean, perfect is she, sense. Is she stalk? I mean, is she stalking me or what? I mean, I, it, I, I don't know. It's great. Now. I we because you know we'll use it <laughs> like when people are sleeping in the house. You still like these assistants become very. Uh, you know, integrated into our lives. And so it's like, well, I want to like find out the weather or I want to turn off the lights or, you know, whatever. Actually, the lights now, it doesn't, it just gives the little chime confirmation, which I well, like. Well, just run the app, run the Alexa app. Oh, sorry, I, I said that it. Word. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, you could. But if I don't have my phone with me, I mean, I the, the devices are right there. So yeah, so you can whisper and it'll whisper back so it won't be loud. So there you go. Like I said, whispers. why would you not have your phone with you? What do you like live in the mountains or, or, or? I don't always have my phone with me. I yeah. No, well, I have these really? assistants around my house. Wow. What do I need them for? Uh, All yeah. good. All right. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sometimes I have my watch with me, but, you know, of course, not everything's in home kit all the time. So, you know, you can't do that either. So, yeah, there you go. Hey, I want to uh, to take a minute and talk about our first sponsor, if that's okay by you, John. Fantastic. 
So our first sponsor today is Clear at clearme.com slash MacGeekGab. I know it's a different URL. They, they, they needed a longer one, so we couldn't use the normal one. So we use slash MacGeekGab and code MacGeekGab. So Clear is, it's awesome. There, there's a WWDC story that I have held back from you, John, because I wanted to wait and tell it here. Coming home from San Jose, the airport was full of people, even at like six o'clock in the morning. And I was like, oh, man, this is crazy. But before I left, I had signed up online at clearme.com slash MacGeekGab. And I had used code MacGeekGab to get two months of clear free. And what clear is, is it's a really simple way to authenticate yourself at the airport. Instead of using your ID, you just scan your boarding pass. And then you use either your fingerprints or your eye scan or a combination of them. It, it changes every time. And uh, and then they uh, assuming that that, you know, gives them the thumbs up, which which it did for me, of course, um, they treat you like a diplomat. They bring you right to the conveyor for putting your stuff out and uh and, you know, and then you go through whatever I had also had pre-check and clear and TSA pre-check work really, really well together because you just go right thing. And I just walked through the metal detect. It was like I, it, like it couldn't possibly have taken me a minute uh, all told to do it the whole thing. But, um, yeah, it was it was awesome. And it really makes life easy. I Like I said, I signed up online before I before I left. And then when I landed in San Jose, um, on my way in, I went to the clear kiosk to finish my setup so that I would be ready to go for my, my morning flight out, you know, five days later or whatever. And that, I mean, it took me two minutes online to sign up at clear me, C L E A R M E.com slash Mac geek code Mac geek two minutes to sign up there. And then another, maybe two minutes to, you know, go through the, to finish the process in the airport. It really, it's, like I said, it's it's the VIP treatment. It's like you're a you know, you're like you're a diplomat or whatever. And and it's great. You leave your ID in the pocket in your pocket because you don't need it. They use your eyes or your fingerprints. They're in a bunch of airports. They just added Boston near me, which is great. But even if they're not in the airport right near you, they will likely be in the airports to where you are flying and therefore flying home from. So it can totally be worth it. They, they're in. It, the the notes they gave me here say they're in over 40 stadiums and airports around the country. Um, I think it's over 50 mm -hmm. now. And you can add up to three adult family members um, at, you know, at a discounted rate. So, yeah, this is it's totally awesome. And I highly recommend it, man. If you do any amount of travel, check this out and you get two months for free. Like I said, go to clearme.com slash Mac Geek Gab. Use code Mac Geek Gab and you get. Two months of clear for free. You get treated like a diplomat, just like me. It's awesome. Our thanks to clear for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, you know, there's one other thing from, uh, from WWDC from my travels at WWDC that I was reminded of actually, as we were putting this together and that's the ear in M two, uh, wireless earphones that, um, that are ear earbuds, I should say. They were the very first of the true wireless. Their M ones were, and man, like I've I've been using their M twos for a while. I sort of take them for granted because they're just in my travel kit. But it, they are the most comfortable true wireless in ear things that I've had. They're more comfortable than AirPods, and they seal in your ear, so you can use them on an airplane. Mm -hmm. Um, but man, just opening up my iPad to watch a movie with no cables or anything like that. It's awesome. It sounds so good. So good. So I just wanted to re-mention the, uh, the earrings because I highly recommend them. I, I went to their website. It looks like they're in between production models or whatever, because they're yeah, I'm there and it out. says sold out, man. Yeah. So they're, they're having a rush on them, that, which is good, but, uh, keep an eye out. And, and if we hear about them coming back around, uh, you know, if getting more stock or whatever, we'll, I'll mention it. So again. they're, so they're not customized in that you don't send them the mold, but no. you were satisfied with the quality of the seal. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They seal really well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's nice. They don't like for me in my ears, I can I could actually like have my ear against a pillow or whatever or against the side of the seat 
and they it doesn't bother me. They're really tiny and just like fit right in the ear. So, yep. So there you go. It's pretty cool, man. Uh, you know, we have had some, uh, we've had some reviews as of late on Apple podcasts and I wanted to share a few of them with all of you here because, uh, well, because they came from many of you. So, uh, and you can, you can, if you want to leave us a review, we would love it. It's always great. But, um, and we, we appreciate it greatly, um, from Ian Fiddler from the UK says, uh, I first started listening back in 2012, a few years after I got my first iMac through John and Dave. I learned to love using the Mac more uh, and a more than a feeling I ever had for my previous Windows machines. I got into listening to many podcasts and after five years, I subscribed to so many that I had to let some of them go. Mac Geek Gab was one of those. And then. Four weeks ago, I dipped into an episode and there they were just as I'd left them all the cool stuff and all the troubleshooting tips that I had stoked my love in the first place. I am back, baby. Ian, it is a pleasure to have you back. And thanks for leaving the review. Like I said, you can go to MacGeekGab.com slash iTunes. I'll probably have to change that uh, because iTunes is, you know, going to become less and less relevant of a term, isn't it, John? But um but that's where you can go. What's to, iTunes? Yeah, it's I know. Gone. It's gone. I know. But that's where you can go to to that's the closest we can get you to leaving a review is really all 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 that is. Uh, we can't get you right to the like to the, the front of the line or whatever it's it's called. Uh we've got a couple more here from Asmac Tech here in USA says always has great information. I really do learn a lot and have actually found a lot of great apps and utilities based on their recommendations. Keep it up. Thank you for that. Uh, Let's see. I've got a couple more here from Hughes too. I have enjoyed listening to Dave and John for many years now and have used their knowledge to solve countless Mac and iOS problems. Took me a long time to work out which one was which. If you're a new listener, here's a tip. Here's what he says, John. Dave is Tigger. John is Eeyore. I wouldn't necessarily call you Eeyore. You're not sad. You're you're just more measured um, in your tone. I if, if yes, I I I actually agree with that comparison because yeah. it's a good comparison for for yeah, listeners. Uh, I, it, it, as far as perceived energy level, I would yes. say that Eeyore is relatively low key, and Tigger is like a spaz. That's right. I mean, there come on, go. he's bouncing around all the time. He's bouncing around all the time, uh, yeah. and has more energy. So, so I would say energy project. Your your comments on energy projection, I think, are quite accurate. It's a it's a good litmus test for anybody that's having trouble deciphering who is who. So, yeah, thank you so much for all these reviews. There's more and more, but like <laughs> it, it's been great. Thank you. So, if you're if you're inclined to leave a review, we would love it. It's great. All right, let's get to some questions. I don't know how I'd want to be in that world, Dave, though. I don't think I'd want to be Eeyore if I was living in that world. I No, Eeyore Eeyore is sad in that world. Pooh. Well, there you go. Or Pooh, I I don't know. You know, who would you want to be? Uh, we don't get to choose who we are, right? We just we're just ourselves and then and then other people see us, right? It's just how it goes. Uh, It's getting pretty deep. That is good. I know you asked, you know. So there you go. Yeah. Uh, Sean has a question. He says, in listening to episode 762, you guys are talking about Clean My Mac and Malwarebytes, and I'm wondering, are there similar programs for the iPhone, or are they even needed? So that's a good question, and you're right. Um, so Malwarebytes, they, they were sponsors. Uh, they had a run for a while. They may actually be coming back, which is great. But one thing they did, they asked us to talk about Malwarebytes for the Mac during those sponsorships. One thing that I think we've mentioned once or twice, but uh, it's worth mentioning again, is that there is malware bytes for iOS, which can help with like not only different like web threats and things like that, but can also help with scam callers and, and that sort of thing. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes. That's definitely worth checking out. As far as clean my Mac, there's no iOS analog for clean my iOS because we don't get to touch iOS at the same level that we get to touch the Mac, there's like, there's, there's nothing an app could do. Uh, apps only get to touch their own data. You can't, you can't even give them permission to touch like cache files from other apps and things like that. So, uh, so sadly there is no clean my 
iPhone. I mean, there is, I think, but it's not the same kind of thing. So, yeah. I mean, I guess there's iMazing, right? You could use <laughs> iMazing. No, and you can do some cleanup with that, it, but it's not, it's just not the same type of thing. But yeah, there you go. Yeah. I don't know. There you go. Um, well, there's another way to clean things up. What's that? On an iOS device. Uh, you do a restore, baby. <laughs> that is if things one way. get really right. bad on your iOS device. One way to solve the problem. Now, the thing is, you should be making backups of your iOS device. But sometimes things get so screwed up. And because, as Dave mentioned, you can't really get into the innards of iOS as easily as you can with Mac OS. And that there aren't dedicated cleaning programs. You may have to do a restore. Yeah. Now, it takes time. But I've been in that scenario before where some cache files on iOS have gotten munged. And um, and if you just do a backup and restore that, that tends to solve it like mail, especially will hold on to old settings and old uh, like it caches mailboxes in a way that is uh, frankly unhealthy. Um, and there's no way to tell it to let go. You can delete the account. And when you bring it back, it goes and attaches to the old cache. The old, I've solved it two ways with mail. One is exactly what you said, John. Back up the phone, wipe it, restore, no more cache, right? Because it, 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 it doesn't back that up, thank goodness. And the other way I solved it, it happened to be a Gmail account that it was happening with. Uh, it's saved by, just like it is on the Mac, your mail is cached by username at it's by essentially by email address, but it's at server address. So it's username at server address. So it was whatever, like, you know, I'm not Dave at Gmail, but whatever it was, Dave at Gmail at imap.gmail.com. Google has a second batch of servers uh, or a second batch of DNS entries, I should say. So instead of using imap.gmail.com, you can use imap.googlemail. Dot com. So I changed the server and then that bypassed the cache. So there you go. So there you go. You know, that's um, that's that's. Yeah, I'm glad you up. mentioned that because it's unfortunate that you have to take such drastic measures to clean up. Yeah. The yuck. But yeah. sometimes I, you I, I would I would love it if there was a clean my iOS app that actually like did it right. Did, mm. There's no way for that to exist. So whatever you find out there, it will not be doing it now. But now another thing yeah. to, to throw this in the ring. So I'm going to throw something in the ring. Throw. I hope you won't mind. But um, no, I had this today. So I was using the camera app. Yeah. And I would take a picture and it would crash. Oh. It would like go to the, uh, the, the you know, the, the it would go to the, the home screen. And I'm like, what? Oh, that's bad. I was taking a picture by hitting one of the volume buttons, which if you don't know this, so this is at least one thing that you can learn. But I think it's, is, is it the minus either, or the plus? E button? Either one will will act as the shutter for the camera. <clears throat> OK, so if you can't or if you can't see the shutter button on the screen, then you can hit one of the buttons somewhere else on the phone and, and take a picture. Yep. The thing is, what was happening is that I would take the picture and then I would look at the phone and it was like it crashed. Huh. So um, the way I solved this problem was hold down the power button. It shuts off. It turns back on. It asks for my passcode. And then everything was great. Huh. It makes me shed a tear, Dave, because the solution to the problem is to turn it off, then on again. Turn it off and <laughs> but on. But it happened That's to it. me. I, I mean, it never happened. I've, I've never had the camera app crash on me. And I don't know. If, so first, I like tried to quit all my other apps because I thought another app was in the background was like doing something bad. But no, that didn't fix it. And now it's yeah. fine. It's just the mystery of iOS. and <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That's, but have you that's, had that happen? Like um, an Apple app crashing when you do something and it's like, what? Oh, definitely. It, it's a good reminder that our iPhones need rebooting too. Um, it, you know, the, the, our Macs, right. I, I, I tend to reboot my Mac about once a week. I know some people like to, you know, chase their uptime numbers or whatever. I just find my Mac far more stable if I reboot it once a week. <laughs> so that's what I do. But um, with iOS, there's there's no like you don't think about it because you you just, you know, it just sleeps all the time and you charge it and you could your phone could be up for weeks or months until there's a software update. So, yeah. Yeah. No, re re you know, turn the iPhone off and on. That's not a bad, not a bad one. 
I like it. Paul has uh, Paul has a question for us about Catalina. He says, uh, where am I here? Whoa. Uh oh, do I have a bad PDF? I, I know what his question was. There it is. OK, uh, he says, I've never upgraded my 2016 15 inch MacBook Pro from High Sierra to Mojave. I didn't do a clean install when I went to High Sierra and APFS from uh, from HFS plus Sierra. So there's that conversion that happened. Uh, he says, and I'm very much leaning towards doing a clean install when I next upgrade because my Mac seems to be a little sluggish. And I thought maybe a fresh install on a native APFS volume uh, as opposed to a converted one might help. So my question is this, I've held off moving to Mojave because I didn't really see any real benefit, but I really like the look of Catalina and sidecar and many of its other features. But Apple's doing quite a bit with the new system volume uh, where it's read only and obviously a separate volume, which is different from Mojave. I'm wondering whether it might be best to miss Mojave altogether and go straight to Catalina when it's released. If I were to do this, do you think I would benefit from a clean install of the OS onto a native APFS file system reformatted? Um, or do you think that the difference between Mojave and Catalina in terms of how it treats the the uh, system volume isn't going to be a big deal uh it or isn't going to be as big of a deal as the migration from hfs plus to apfs so I, i'll say that anything that we're about to say here is basically theoretical i mean it's based on some you know experiential knowledge with with what we've seen with mojave but you know i've only installed catalina on one machine so can't really speak in any way about, you know, and it's a developer beta too, as John said, you know, things will change. So, uh, although it's run fine, like I've had almost no problems with it when running it, which is kind of bizarre. Um, uh, it's a very stable beta, but, um, I will say this, um, if you're cool waiting for the fall, uh, then why not? do the clean install. I, I think whatever you do next, whether it's Mojave or Catalina, I highly recommend. Yes. Just do it from a clean install. You will avoid any of those weird problems that so many people reported to us with those, you know, APFS converted volumes. But that said, if you want to do Mojave now and then upgrade to Catalina, I feel pretty good about this migration from the I'll call it one volume of APFS of Mojave to the two volume of Catalina. That's not entirely true. There's actually a third recovery volume. Right. But um, because the thing is, it's not all these volumes in APFS aren't like partitions were prior. Right. They are um, it, they're just pointers. It's just like, well, organize these files this way. I mean, it's 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 somebody's going to yell at me for saying this, but it's almost like, you know, just separate folders. It they're all on the same storage. They're, they're all in the same blob of storage. There's no physical separation like there used to be in the old days. So saying I want another volume to an APFS disk is like it'll say okay cool here you go put whatever you want in it do you want a quota on it meaning do you want to limit the size of the documents that can be there or do you not and do you just want to have it share the big blob of data and when it's full by whatever means it's full and that's the end of it um so moving to a system volume in that sense really isn't a big deal in fact it's probably a safer uh, upgrade installation than anything we've had in the past because it probably doesn't have to replace anything. It just puts the new stuff out there and deletes the old, you know, once it's done. So I think we might even have less instances, and this is speculation, less instances of even failed install or failed upgrades from Mojave to Catalina. So, yeah, I think I think you're fine. If you want to do Mojave now, I would do that clean based on what you've said. And then uh, and then, you know, go from there. So, yeah. What do you think, John? Um. I'm going to disagree. I I just go straight from the old to the new. In what way? Like, well, go for, rather than doing an interim update, just just you know, go all the way. Oh yeah, sure. If know, he wants to wait just, till the fall, that's just what I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if he, I mean, he doesn't have Mojave now, so if he wants Mojave now, but um, would you say that he should just upgrade or or wipe that drive? Yes. Which? No, I, I, 
if it was me, I think I would just do the upgrade when it's available, when the release is available. Even though he's on a, a disc that was upgraded from HFS plus to or migrated from HFS plus to APFS. Yes. Uh, Even though we we've, we've learned that lesson mm. the hard way. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. The thing is, the thing is, I got to tell you, my friend, is that both of my systems, I, I have not done a clean install in either of my systems. When I run this utility, when there are problems. Both of my systems are migrated systems using what was it APFS convert underscore convert I think yeah. is what you see when you run this I utility. Thought, I thought with all those problems, I'm you still had in, in that fall. state. I, oh, I thought you fixed that. Oh, interesting. Oh, oh I had not, uh, I had not reformatted my systems, but the thing is, I think the problem was kind of fixed in the background because if you run something like our pal hardware growler. I'll see every now and then it's like mounting recovery or mounting firmware up. And I'm like, what are you doing? Have you seen these? I don't don't know. I don't run hardware growlers. So I know. But the thing is, hardware growler shows you when the OS or other things mount something like my favorite is, oh, Google update is updating your stuff because Google update is kind of sneaky. Is it doesn't really ask you or tell you it just like right. does it in the background right but right. hardware growl shows you a disc mounting and it's like ah but i see the same thing every now and then it's like oh recovery mounted and i'm like well why did recovery mount that's I interesting didn't ask it too huh or firmware sometimes it shows like you know firmware blah 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 blah, blah uh mounted and i'm like what the heck's that and I, so i figure they're doing maintenance in the background where <sighs> I guess what I'm saying is that, yes, I understand the concern about the the, I think most people would agree that the conversion process from um, HFS plus to APFS was had some issues. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that I have not I have not done a fresh install and it seems that whatever problems they had have fixed themselves or 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 you aren't seeing symptoms of them anymore. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, which may mean that they have fixed themselves. I mean, that's totally possible. Huh. All right. Well, there you go. So, they take uh I don't know what to tell you, Paul. There you go. Like I I I am happy. I mean, to that- me it's just it's it's just your time. The thing is I I I my only concern is when I hear about doing a you know, nuke and pave and and fresh install and stuff is that it just <clears throat> the mechanics of doing so especially if you have to get all your codes, you know, it's just, it's a pain in the neck. It's not as much of a pain in the neck as you might think. Like I've, I, okay. You, you've been through it. Yeah. And and I, I, I avoided it. And then when I did it, it was like, Oh, I I should have just done this. Like, this is fine. Well, as long as you keep good records or you buy your apps on the app store, which to me, that's the best solution. Yeah. If you buy all your apps in the app store, you don't need to enter the. If all my apps were available in the app store and then Apple didn't cripple them, that would be great. But, you know, but most of them are. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. A a lot of them anyway. Yep. Set app is another source of, of apps for me. And that's, you know, another way to do that. Oh yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, Oh, While well, we're on the subject, why not? Craig has <laughs> uh, has a question. He says, I have a 2015 5K Retina iMac. It started its life with El Capitan and has progressed via upgrades to Sierra, High Sierra, and now Mojave. System has been progressively become more sluggish over this time frame. Now there is lag on occasion when launching apps, switching apps, etc., I use it for basic business things, nothing unusual or out of the mainstream office, Skype for biz, etc. He says, I use iStat menus and I see no unusual consumption of resources. So I write the sluggishness off to aging hardware, although somewhat surprised at how frequent the sluggishness is. It's worse at system boot, but I'm thinking uh, some of that has to do with disk indexing that happens. Given all the above. My plan is to have my one terabyte hard drive replaced with a one terabyte SSD. The question relates into the manner in which to make the migration. One option is to simply use carbon copy cloner uh, and clone the hard drive, install the SSD and then use carbon copy cloner to clone it back to the SSD. However, I'm worried in doing that, that any major cruft will simply remain and continue to make the system run less than optimally. 
The other option I'm considering is to do a fresh build of the latest OS boot uh, on the SSD. The reason for this is that I can then use Migration Assistant to bring everything over to the new OS. This is where the question comes in. When using Migration Assistant from a clone that was LCAP, Sierra, High Sierra, Mojave, is this reduction in cruft sufficient versus doing that nuke and pave that, uh, that we just mentioned? So I'll answer the second question first, since that's basically the topic that we're on. Then I want to talk about the, the, the way to get to the SSD. But um, I, yeah, I, I, like I said, it's to me, it's not that bad to, to do the, the migration or to do the nuke and pave. Um, it's been a while. I mean, you're talking four different OS versions on there. There's probably a lot of crap out there that you just aren't going to want to mess with. So I would, I, I would do the nuke and pave on this one. Um, and then would I use migration assistant? Probably not. I would be tempted to migration assistant mm. does an okay job, but it, it doesn't know what it doesn't know, right? It can't know that you aren't interested in that app you installed once. And so it's going to bring that folder in your library folder over along with you. So that's where I feel like, you know, the nice part is you will be left with a, a clone of your old drive as it was. So at any time, if there's something missing, you can just go back to it and bring it over. So you're in a very good position here. I, I would, I would do the nuke and pave. I would take this option to do it. That, that's, that's just me. What do you think, man? <clears throat> okay. <laughs> But it, are you still the same mind? Why were you expecting system? me to? Are you ex expecting me to challenge you? Not necessarily. I just you uh, know, you're a free thinker. Yeah, we're all free thinkers. Well, we'd like to think. We think we're except free for the alien overlords, That's right? Who command our every? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the mind's good. Mine's mine's a. Yeah, I've got my overlord very nice trained overlord. pretty well. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, um, I have to whisper the only to thing, it, but that's you know that's that's fine. Yeah, yeah. In 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 the in the shadows. In the shadows. That's night. right. Yes. <laughs> what? Oh my gosh, I got to tell you some of the shows I've been watching. <laughs> maybe yeah. a little later. Maybe maybe uh, off but, um, later. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I think is that so you know I mean we have this recurring discussion about Croft, and the thing is, what's everybody's deal with Croft? I mean, is it the space it takes up, or is it the additional complexities it causes in your your system stability that makes you not want to have config files and caches and stuff from old things so one thing oh one thing i would suggest all right if if you don't want to do the nuke and pave um onyx i found is very good in that they do have i, I think it's the maintenance category but the thing is they have so if you're concerned about cruft is in like old stale data that's going to screw things up because it uses that instead of the fresh data which it should but sometimes it doesn't then um onyx i think is one of your best friends well clean my mac uh, and clean my mac I, i'd say would be another one that that, that uh, i i was gonna... concerned about the cruftiness the nice part about clean my Mac is it will tell you, Hey, look, you haven't launched this app in more than six months, more than a year, you know, those kinds of things. And so you could, it, you know, use that and say, all right, I want to delete this, this stuff. And then it will go and, and be fairly thorough about, you know, finding all the other things that are out there. So that's actually a feature I would love on iOS. Something that would tell me you haven't used this app in six months. Do you want me to delete it? God, I don't just want it to offload it. Well, they kind of do that now, right? Don't they? With the offload. As far uh, last I checked, last I checked, you can you can defer apps to the cloud if you're running out of space. But I don't want to defer right? it to the cloud. If I installed it and used it once, and well, all right. yeah, you, you know, like okay. I, yeah, yeah, and I actually the defer to the cloud thing bit me once because I was offline in a theater and I was like, great, uh, I need to launch the Mixer app that I put on here a year ago. So that when I ran into this mixer, I would be in good shape. And it's like, oh, that's that's right. offline in the cloud. It's like, why? I don't know. <laughs> no, this iPad is only used for this. Like, don't mess with it. But anyway. Uh, no. So you, you probably accidentally left that setting. I on. did. Yeah. I've since fixed that. That's right. Yeah. I for, and I, I mean, in theory, it's a good. Is, I, but, I mean, I think in theory, it's a good idea. But if you're not in an area that has reliable connectivity, then yeah, that, that can be a bummer. It's a, yeah, a little <laughs> bit of a bummer. 
Yeah, that's that's one way to put it. That's cool. <laughs> like an app you need now. Yeah. And there's no way to get it. If you go into oh, uh, settings, this is on iOS and presumably iPad OS if you're mm. running a beta, but settings, iTunes and App Store, there is uh, an option for offload unused apps, apps. And so you should if you should make a mindful choice about that. Um, it might be fine for you or you might be like me and not want that at all. So yeah, good stuff. Um, in terms of Craig, like getting that SSD in there, you, you certainly can, like it's a, it's a retina iMac. It's not that hard to go in there and take it apart, but you've got Thunderbolt on that. So you don't have to replace the SSD, uh, or replace Hmm. the internal hard drive. You could leave the internal hard drive right where it is, had have your SSD external on like a USB three bus or whatever. And, uh, and just boot from an external drive. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, your iMac, unless it's, unless you treat it like a portable machine and you're carting it around all the time, uh, probably, you probably won't even realize that you're booting from an external drive. You just set it up and set it and forget it. Ronco style. So I, that, that's what I would do just to <laughs> save, I don't know, save time. <laughs> Ronco, you know, Ron Popeil, the guy on TV with like the, the chopper and the slicer or whatever. And, and he has that, the Ron Popeil, I call it the easy bake oven. It's not, it, but you know, he had, or maybe it is. I don't know. I don't think it is. I think that's for kids, <laughs> but um, oh, I thought you said Ron Co. Well, Ron Co is, is the totally name of his company. Story. No, Ron Co. Oh, it is. Ron okay. Co is Ron Popeil. Yeah. And, uh, and his, his whole thing was set it and forget it. Right. You know, so that was his whole deal. So, Yeah. Only available w- through this TV offer. Correct. Not available in stores. Not available <laughs> as seen on TV. I was wondering about that. Yeah. It's like, what's, what's so wrong with your product that you don't <laughs> sell it in stores? Well, stores charge you, charge you like, like shelf fees and like, it's crazy, man. Stores like, especially when. Yeah, Ron- but they also like shield the population from like products that can like harm you or kill you and so the, the whenever i saw this disclaimer i'm like why are you not selling it in stores oh because he can offer you a better price he's ron popeil man but oh you're right no i mean everybody gets their cut or yeah. everybody wants their cut that's so yeah if you sell direct to the consumer i can understand the uh, the business model but yeah, uh, exactly all right uh what else we got here jed's got a question for us jed uh take it away man hey guys this is jed I thought I would leave an audio message. You haven't had as many audio messages as recently, so I thought I would save your voices some. Give them a little rest. Um, I'm calling about a home internet thermostat kind of internet things question. I know it's not Apple, but it's like all kind of the same umbrella nowadays. And I guess my question is what you guys are thinking about them all. I have two nests right now. Um, I'll be moving and I'm debating what to buy. And although I like the fact that utilities usually give you lots of money for a Nest, so they're, they're, they're subsidized, I don't love that the Nest thinks it's smarter than me and isn't so schedule friendly. It's much more like, let me tell you what to do and you will listen to me. It may be smarter than me, but I don't want to be told that it is. So I was curious what your thoughts were. Uh, I like that the idea of, I think it's the Ecobee or the Honeywell that has, you could put different zones in different rooms. Um, I know you had talked about that, but, uh, I know it's not as intuitive as the nest. So I'm just trying to kind of figure it all out. Thought it'd be worth, you know, going down the rabbit hole. Thanks a lot. And, uh, this is actually my second time I recorded this because the first time the wind just made it inaudible through my AirPods. So I guess I kind of got caught. <laughs> all right. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Jed. Yeah, Um, you're right. That is the problem with the nest is that it thinks it's smarter than you. And I think that is probably true for a a lot of the people that built it. Um, And I don't mean to say that they're uh, smarter is the wrong thing. It knows more than you perhaps is is a better way to say that, because certainly the people that built it were smart Um, and the people that use it are smart. But it really is targeted for people in temperate environments. Right. So, I mean, it was built in San Francisco uh, and that and that's great where it completely falls apart is if you live somewhere where it gets and stays below like, you know, 30 for weeks at a time, 30 Fahrenheit for weeks at a time. And uh, if you live in one of those environments, you have figured out what works well for your house. 
uh, either that or you are independently wealthy and you don't care what you spend on your utility bills. <laughs> well, it's one or the other, you know, uh, but um, it and, and, and bringing a nest into that environment is an endlessly frustrating scenario because it's like, no, 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 no. Tr- trust me. I know how this house works. Like you got to work with me here. And it's tough. I have a nest here in the studio and I, you can wrangle it, but it takes a lot of work because it's not its default state. By default, it just wants to figure out what you want. It's like, yeah, no, 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 no. I, I actually already kind of know. So let me do this. But it'll 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 try and outsmart you. The eco bee, I wouldn't say is not. In fact, I would say is intuitive. It's it's great. It was also built in Toronto where it happens to get cold for long stretches of time. So you won't be surprised to hear that the way the Ecobee works is it remember it, it lets you program it and then it will do some smart things. Like if it notices that you're home during a period where you've said you're away, well, then it'll turn the heat on. Right. You know, but and it has recovery times that are that are more built towards this type of climate. And I, using both of them, you know, in parallel with each other, it, there's just no competition um, the Ecobee is a much better solution if, uh, if you're in a climate where you've got, um, you know, real hot and real cold. They don't I mean, they have like weeks of it in San Francisco, but not, you know, not seasons. So um, and the Ecobee is cool because you've got these remote sensors. So a lot of us in New England, you know, you have one zone of heat per floor in a lot of cases or whatever. And that's not helpful because the thermostats in a hallway somewhere it's like well yeah but i want it to get the temperature right in the living room so ecobee has these remote sensors that you put in like your living room or your kitchen or wherever and it will sense which rooms you are in with motion sensors and adapt the heat to get the temperature you want in the rooms that you are actually in which is really cool um Mm -hmm. so and i've tried so those are those are some wi-fi thermostats i will caution people to stay away from some of these off-brand like i've i've tried some of these far less expensive wi-fi thermostats you can make them work but like they're sketchy so i haven't found one that you know one of these sub hundred dollar wi-fi thermostats that i feel comfortable about yet but uh, but you've used the bluetooth i have not Wi-Fi, right? You're using Bluetooth ones or Zigbee or something, right? Z-Wave. Z-Wave. Okay. So here's the thing. So to go on the other end of the spectrum, so Dave has had hands-on with what we'll call the smart thermostats. I have extensive hands-on, which I'm going to call stupid thermostats. Oh. <laughs> Not no. that they don't work, but the thing is, my thermostats, Dave, I intentionally... Wanted to get a thermostat that was as generic as possible. So the protocol, but then this gets a bit more complex compared to the other situation here with the smart thermostats, and that you probably want to get a smart home hub. So the thing is, I got a generic Z Wave thermostat, and that's the protocol that a lot of home smart home devices use, and the smart home hub, smart home hubs will talk to. So I got the Go Control thermostat. Um, it's kind of weird because the thing is, it, it's more of a commercial device. I actually met with them at CES, and I'm like, even when I tried to buy it, it was like I could only find one or two offs, like oh, on Amazon. Interesting. It was like nobody was willing to sell me a bunch. But the thing is, I was able to buy them, but I think it was like contractors that were like, <laughs> yeah, they were reselling. So I got one for like whatever. forty bucks and one for fifty bucks and stuff. So, so the company is not necessarily. And I told them this, and I'm like, you know, I'm fine with that. I mean, I was able to buy your product. Sure. But the thing is, it's a Z-Wave thermostat, and the thing is, it offers basic services with a smart home hub. In that you can, depending on the platform, and almost all, whether it be Wink or you know, I've abandoned them, and I now have the uh, smart things from Samsung, but you can set trigger points. So my my needs are simple. It's like, okay, at this time, set the yeah. <clears throat> heat to this. But you could and also have time- it be smart, right? Like, I mean, you could have it say, if I'm home, even during one of these periods, you'd have to set yes. up the rules. Like you said, your thermostat is is dumb right. in that it, it needs something else to be its brain, but you don't have to be its brain. Like you could program a thing right. to be its brain. Yeah. Okay. So if I had like a, a either a presence sensor, which I think some of these smart 
thermostats have, right? Like the Nest yes. knows if there's somebody in the room, yes. right? Yes, but Whereas you also have doesn't. a present. Well, you have a present sensor in your phone, right? Like you could use a geofence to trigger a rule on your smartphone. Right. right. I mean, you would be a little. So more the answer to the question is that you could build your own. It'll take additional work, but it it may do more. Uh, it may, it may do more. Yeah. It may do more that yeah, because as you pointed out or you've observed with the other products, sometimes they don't make the right decision. Yeah, the Ecobee works. <laughs> They're like, well I'm for smarter me, than but, you. But yeah. And and there have been a couple of occasions with the Ecobee where it's like, wait, why is it doing that? And it's like, oh, right, I get it. Okay. Now I understand. Right. Okay. Yep. But but it yeah, they do. They think for you. And honestly, it it if like the Ecobee, I feel like has saved us money. In in the in the long term, because it it allows me to be more aggressive with when I turn off the heat, knowing that, look, if you know, I, I just have the heat off in the house during the day. There are many days where Lisa or one of the kids even are home because they live lives of leisure and don't even go to school a lot of the time. And yet they do really well. <laughs> no, no, it works out like they've look. I don't begrudge you. You're going to hear you're going to you're going to hear about this. If you can organize your life so that you can be a a person of leisure, that's fantastic. And so I live with these people that are that are men and women of leisure and uh, these people and uh, yeah. And uh, and so they're home during the day a lot. And the Ecobee is smart about that. It's like, oh, someone's home. OK, I'll I'll, you know, keep the, the temp up. But otherwise it's off. So I don't have to like actively think about it. So, yeah, that's interesting, huh? Right. So what I do is I either. Um, so the thing is, the default is like, you know, I, I have it heated up in the morning and then turn it off. And the thing is, well, if I'm home, then I'll either manually press the buttons on it because you want to have manual control. Of course. Trust me on this, folks. And this is something that that I see a lot of people that get into the smart home thing don't quite realize is and. I'm telling you, think about this. What's your backup plan if you lose power? Well, if you lose and, power, then. And that's all I'm going to say well, then, is then that your, some devices boiler fare better run. than others. If you if you lose power, your boiler won't start. Correct. So but but, but I found this out during Superstorm Sandy. You know what did work is that I was like, can I take a hot shower? And the reason and, and the answer was yes. Because the hot water heater doesn't need electricity. It just needs gas. Oh, because your hot water <laughs> heater is propane and it is not electrically fired. Right. OK. OK. Yeah, fair. Right. It just sets a pilot. But right. it, it was funny because I, I, I was actually kind of, you know, I felt like I had, you know, an episode of the dumb. I'm like, <laughs> how come I didn't realize that I could get hot water without? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No. Anyway. But, but, yeah. the, but the thing I want to reiterate is that. Think about the situation where your smart devices do not have power, at least in my case. So, for example, I have battery powered thermostats. So even if I lost power, well, the thing is then, yeah, no, to your point. Yeah. So here's <laughs> here's an interesting thing, right? Because there's yeah, if you've got a boiler, there's 24 volts of AC power that oddly enough that is running your boiler. I know. Decision. It's, 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 yes. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, but that's what it is. If you have what they call the common wire or the C wire running from your boiler to where your thermostats are, then you also have 24 volts of power there. If like many homes, you only have two wires running to your heating thermostat, then you have 24 volts of power, but but only in terms of uh, when the circuit is closed, like when the heat is actually running. Otherwise, you don't. And the Ecobee, at least the ones that I've used, I haven't tried the Ecobee for yet. I actually want to try that. But um, but those require you to have that C wire, which means if you have, say, generated power or battery power to run your boiler, which is totally possible. I know someone that, that ran a boiler for days off of a UPS, that, you know, that they took from their computer because, huh. well, because nice. it's so very little power to, to turn the thing on. I mean, it's running on oil or propane or whatever. But um, or natural gas. But uh, if you've got that, then you're fine. Otherwise, um, well, then your thermostat wouldn't run anyway. So like the Nest here in the studio, the nice part about the Nest is that it is it will do what they call power stealing. It will charge its own battery 
from the oh. from the red and white wires from just the single circuit that's there. It doesn't need huh. the common wire. Yeah, they well, say that it's goose there. Exactly. They say that it can cause problems for some people. I've never experienced one. And that's the reason Ecobee did not enter that world. But um, but, you know, there you go. So, yeah. No, it's interesting. I like it, It's kind of like the uh, the ring or some versions yeah. of ring. Yeah. Right. Is that they right. leach power from the uh, the doorbell, which is no, a totally good thing because it keeps the battery. Yeah. Charged. Keeps it going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. My ring has um, has not my ring doorbell has never run out of power uh, because it's, you know, it's just right there. So, yeah. It, oh, yeah. It gets mine's. Its, yeah. Mine's still at 100 last night. Right. Checked. Yeah. So, uh, I, yeah. So what's our story here, folks? Think about if you lose power when you get your smart home and your thermostats because yeah. they may or may not work. That's why I haven't put a, a smart thermostat upstairs because I I need to be able to mm -hmm. to run like off the generated power. So yeah. All right, um, John. While we're on the smart home subject, John has a question. Not not you, John, but you know, listener John. Uh, where is it? There it is. Uh, he says, um, "Oh yeah, that's right. We were talking. Actually, I guess we answered one of his questions in a, in a previous episode." And uh, and about smart home. And he says, I was under the assumption that these companies can read the data that's stored on their respective servers. So it's the smart home companies, Amazon, Google, Ecobee, et cetera. He says, indeed, we've heard stories about employees watching videos, listening to conversations and accessing data. He says, but you mentioned that when the data is stored, that it is encrypted at rest on their servers. Am I thinking about this entirely wrong? Uh, he's got two questions, but let's answer this first one. No, you're not wrong. It is stored encrypted on the, their servers. The the catch is that it is stored encrypted with their keys. So if the wrong employee has access to the data, he can he or she can use the keys of the um the you know of, of of the provider ecobee amazon google whoever it is and look at your data and that can that as as you said you know there there have been some examples of that so yeah stored in, encrypted does not mean out of sight from prying eyes from all prying eyes so there you go yeah any thoughts on that before i move to the next one john no you're right if if somebody has the key so yeah, I mean, I think I'm with you. You're going to have bad eggs in every basket, right? It, it's possible. <laughs> Correct. It's it's human nature, right? Like it's just it's so. And I I would I would speculate that when I did my corporate thing and we store data about certain customers, we may have. Uh, no, we didn't. Absolutely, that's right. <laughs> um, we would not look at personal confidential data without permission. Because my that's, that's just. Unethical. The way I run my house, I am totally fine having cloud based mm -hmm. cameras like the ring stuff aiming out, uh, you know, outside and away from the house. I have my doorbell. I have my I have, you know, two of the floodlight cameras and they're awesome. And I have no issue with that data being stored on ring servers. I do also have a couple of indoor cameras that are aimed inside the house and uh and those are not cloud based. They store to my Synology on my uh, I use Synology surveillance station and I am the only one or my family, too. But, I am you know, we are the only ones that that can see that it is stored locally here and it does not leave um, as far as you know. That's right. Well, you know, if you want to see me, though, for example, if if I just, you know, exhibited my massive hacker skills. I may be able to get into your network and watch you and you wouldn't know it. Yeah, it's, now, it's totally it would possible. Require, it would require a high level of skill. Oh, yeah. And persistence and you not detecting someone trying to hack you. Right. All sure of those things. Tools. Yeah, but it's possible. Right. You can I mean, actually, you of all people might have the best chance at that. Now, I mean, if you want to see me, you know, come down in the morning in my <laughs> underwear to get like orange juice or something like I, I guess um, like, uh, I've had my fill of that. So, right. Yeah. I was going to say, I'm going to be at your house on, on Thursday. So, you know, there you go. Yeah. I just prefer like, unlike our, our friend Jeff, that I just 
wear pants. Yeah, you know? no, that's it's, it always seems to be the Just rule. The right, or at least boxers. Come on, there you go. something. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> there you go. Um, the second question he had was, I understand these devices communicate with their respective home bases regularly. Is that communication channeled through their apps or does it go directly from the device through to the Internet? Uh, he says, either way, if I log out of my account, does that communication stop? So we're talking about HomeKit devices because HomeKit devices uh, are are spoken to directly by either your iPhone or or your HomeKit hub, be that a, a HomePod or an Apple TV or whatever. Uh, so the, it, the, the question is, it depends, right? Um, the devices do not communicate through the through the app to the cloud. They communicate directly to the cloud. Like my Ecobee thermostat talks via Wi-Fi to my router out to the cloud. My app doesn't even have to be. I don't even have to have the app installed if I don't want. I do want. And, and so I do. The Nest is the same way. All of my other Wi-Fi smart home devices are the same way. John's Zig, Z-Wave and Zigbee devices communicate with the smart things hub which then communicates with the cloud it doesn't need john to run an app so that is all true now the question if i log out of you know if i log my thermostat out of my account does it still talk back to ecobee i don't know and i would imagine that the answer to that in fact i am certain that the answer to that is different for every device and every manufacturer because of how they they do things it wouldn't surprise me if those devices do still communicate back because otherwise how do you sign them in right like it it needs to be doing something um but you you know one way actually if you don't if you want to stop them from communicating go in and uh remove your wi-fi credentials from the device now it definitely won't be communicating with anything Oh, and what's the tool? Oh, Princeton. Was it Princeton? Princeton yeah, tool? the Princeton people. That's right. Now, yeah, you know what? Yeah. The thing is, I ran that tool, and I don't know. I, I think it's because it uses something that some of us may know about, but if you don't, it's called ARP spoofing. Right. Address resolution protocol. And the thing is, this is something deep within the bowels of TCP IP, where if you know this one weird trick, kind of like the internet ads, you can impersonate somebody else. The thing is, I ran the tool, Dave, and all of a sudden, like, not 30 seconds later, all of my Eros went red. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that I think Eero Plus, I'm pretty sure, I'm almost certain what happened is Eero Plus was like, whoa, dude, somebody's like hijacking your network, so I'm going to knock everybody the offline. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, it was fascinating. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, I was like, not able to communicate. And then, you know, I was looking at the light on my Eero yeah. or my two arrows downstairs and they were red. And I'm like, well, red's bad, right? <laughs> red's bad. <laughs> so I think, I think Eero plus was stepping in saying, you know, that, that, that it looks like somebody's attacking you. So, huh. so you gotta be it. careful yeah. if you run tools like these. Yeah. 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 But I do want to run it more because yes, I'm very interested in the specifics of, um, either the encryption or just what are these, uh, who are they talking to or what are they saying? Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. No, it's, I'm glad that the, those folks at Princeton built that tool. It was, it was it, it, coincidentally, I happened to be touring Princeton like three days after <gasps> oh. we talked about that tool. So I didn't meet with anybody there, but oh my I gosh, was, you talked to them. Oh, oh I, well, I, I, I let everybody know that, that, you know, whenever we mention something in the show, I, I just let them know. And so I let the Princeton people know. And it just so happened they replied to my email while I was sitting and waiting for the pre-tour presentation <laughs> to begin. It was like, uh, so I replied. I'm like, ironically, I'm replying from such and such hall on Princeton's campus. So it's, I don't know. It's just whatever. That yeah, was good. Anyway, uh, I want to thank all of our premium subscribers that uh, who's contributions came in in the last couple of weeks if you're interested in becoming a mac geek Gab premium subscriber of course we would appreciate it it is not mandatory by it at by any stretch this is for those of you that can and want to help uh support the show directly we all appreciate it when i say all i mean everybody all the listeners and certainly uh me and john of course but uh but yeah so this week 
we had actually in the last two weeks, because I don't think we did this last week. We had uh, a one time contribution from Sandra from New Hampshire for a hundred bucks. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, on our monthly ten dollar uh, plan, we had contributions from Robert from Alabama, Tony from California, Gary from New York, Frederick from Tennessee, Elizabeth from Virginia, Robert from Florida, Stephen from California, Ward from Arizona, Joan from Florida, Ev the Nerd. Olga from Washington. I got to meet Ev the Nerd. That was good. Uh, and Brian Monroe and many other people. Uh, Jason from South Carolina. Stephen from Illinois. Nick from Michigan. Kenneth from New South Wales. Paul from Indiana. Mark from Connecticut. Ryan from Texas. Neil from Connecticut. Scott from Portland. Peter from Maine. Bob from Austin and Working Smarter for Mac users. James from San Antonio. Jay from New Jersey. Chris from Hertfordshire. Joe from Kansas, Abdullah from Maryland, and Ari from California. All of those on the $10 a month plan. Thank you. Thank you. And on the biannual $25 every six month plan, Paul from Massachusetts, Stephen from Pennsylvania, Patrick from Louisiana, Paul from Florida, Brent from Pennsylvania, Peter from Oslo, James from Victoria, Jeff from San Diego, Dorsey from Texas, Tony from Chicago, Joe from Austin at 50 every uh, six months, Michael from Maryland, Francis from New South Wales, Larry from California, John from Michigan, Phil from New Mexico, Chris from D.C. at $50, Anders from Vastras for at 35 every six months, and Stacy from California, thanks to all of you. And like I said, MacGab.com slash premium is where you can go to... Uh, to learn all about that. So thank you so much to all of you. You, you rock. I'm, I'm, I'm putting my hands together and thanking you. Yeah. You can't see it. So I, I am too, Dave. Um, I'm wondering though, did, did we mention our email at, at some point in the program? We yeah. haven't. Uh, the next question actually came into our email, which is <coughs> feedback at MacGeekGab.com. And you know, I heard you perfectly. I think we have a crystal clear connection here my with goodness. no, well, you know, a little lag. I don't know, I'm seeing like 20 milliseconds. But anyways, I think what you said, Dave, was feedback at MacGeekGab.com. I said feedback at MacGeekGab.com, and that's the address to which Mike wrote his question about Plex streaming. He says, I use an iMac uh, 5K late 2014, uh, lots of RAM, lots of storage as the server and have all my files on the Synology over the network. A streaming movie started stuttering. When the iMac initiated Carbon Copy Cloner, which was copying some unrelated files from the Synology to an external drive on the iMac. I received the message on Plex that there was not enough bandwidth to stream the media and the movie would start and stop. Once Carbon Copy Cloner was finished, everything was back to normal and the movie streamed just fine. I use a direct Ethernet connection between the iMac, the Synology, the Apple TV uh, that is playing the media the movie was a large file, uh, uncompressed Blu-ray at about 30 gigs, but I don't typically have any issues with these. So I have some questions. Does it make sense that Carbon Copy Cloner would use enough bandwidth to slow down the network? Is there a good way to monitor local network traffic to determine how the network resources are being used? And is there a way to protect a defined amount of bandwidth on the local network for certain activities like Plex streaming? So I want to take a step back here. And not assume that bandwidth was your issue. Yes, I realize that in the end, the amount really? of, yes, hmm. and I'll, I'll right. explain why, but I may be wrong and, and please challenge me on this, but I realize in the end, the data was not getting to the Apple TV in time, right? So definitely that's the, the problem, but I'm not convinced that ethernet bandwidth was the issue. Um, it is one possibility, but I don't think it was. <laughs> So let's think about this. Carbon Copy Cloner was copying data from the Synology down to your Mac, essentially flowing data in the same direction as the movie, reading from the Synology across the Ethernet to your Mac. And then the Carbon Copy Cloner data is being stored to a drive there. And the Plex data is then from the Mac being sent back out across the wire to the Apple TV. Um, even 1080p streaming doesn't take a lot of Ethernet bandwidth in the grand scheme of things. Doing some back of the napkin math, it's like six megabits per second or something, I, I think. Maybe a lot less than that, depending on compression and things like that. So it could be bandwidth, but it's probably not Ethernet bandwidth. Mm. I'm thinking the bottleneck is his Synology. Um, I'm curious what kind of disk station mm. it is. I think it's a 2013 based disk station. 
Um, he sent me some data. It's only got two uh, gigs, two gigs of RAM. Yep. And well, uh, thirteen tells us that it was made in twenty thirteen. So it's right. Mm-hmm. That's what I said. Yeah. It's so that's quite dated. Analogy. Correct. Uh, okay. No, I was just clarifying for people that don't understand their yeah, technology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, so this is an old unit w- with probably not a very beefy processor. Yeah. And he's asking Carbon Copy Cloner to read data from that Synology as fast as it can and send that data across Apple File Protocol or SMB. Both of those things take CPU time. Both of those things require RAM. So I, I like that's where... I think the bottleneck is, is we're asking the Synology to send us data. And because there's no way to tell Carbon Copy Cloner, hey, ask it more slowly, right? You're just saying, give me that file. And it so it reads that file and it goes and saves it over there. And I think that's where the problem is. Um, it could be a CPU thing on the Mac, but I really don't think that Mac is going to have CPU trouble doing what it's doing. It's not even transcoding the movie. Um, it's just, you know, sending okay. It to I was going to ask you that. Do, do you believe transcoding, which is when a f- video file is in one format and the receiver wants it to be in another, I guess yeah. is the best way to explain it. That's right. No, that's a good way to explain. somebody needs a processor to do that. Now, it could be a Synology processor, which, hey, the, the latest Synologies and even this one. I mean, I got a 2013 and it's it, it actually does pretty good, Dave. For, it can. Uh, video yeah, no, work. It, that's the thing is I ran a 2012 for a long time. I ran a 412 plus and and it it did fine with some transcoding. I don't know that it would do 4K stuff. So the question is here, is it the transcoding mechanism? No, there's or is no it transcoding. You, there's no transcoding on this, this, this video. Okay. And, and the transcoding would be done by the iMac, not the Synology in this scenario. Cause Plex server could uh, run on the Synology, but it's not in his scenario. It's running on the, Oh, iMac. it's not. Okay. Yeah. So is it, I mean, but it sounds like the pipe is big enough. So what's, what's the bottleneck here? CPU or Ram on the disk station. I think okay. we're just reading okay. too much data. So, There's a couple things you can use just like you can use activity monitor or iStat menus on the Mac. There's an app on the Synology called resource monitor that will give you the same type of data in its performance tab. And you can see is the CPU getting maxed out? It probably is. I know it sounds strange, but when you're reading lots of data, that actually causes a CPU load on the Synology because it has to send it across the network, it has to use SMB or AFP or whatever protocol you're doing and only having, I know it doesn't, it, it, two gigs of RAM is might not be enough for what you're doing, depending on what else is running on the Synology. So check that out. Well, the protocol as well. Correct. Well, you mentioned, I think you mentioned, but the protocol, the thing is AFP is probably not the best choice. Uh, yeah. And I don't know if he's SMB using or. AFP or SMB, but either one is going to use some CPU time, right? So I, I really think that's what it is. But you got to just check the, the resource monitor. One piece of advice that I will share is um, depending on which Synology, I think it's the 1513 plus that he said, which means it has five drive bays. Um, and so if he has an extra drive bay buying even like a 128 gig or a 256 gig SSD, and putting that in and configuring it as an SSD cache, that might solve the problem. Because if the problem is reading data and it says in the Synology is smart enough to say, oh, that movie file is something I'm routinely accessing right now. I should put that on the SSD. Now it's offloading some of that responsibility. So an SSD cache in your Synology can make a huge difference. I've actually been messing around with a couple of things on the uh, on the Synology in this front lately uh you know we love those seagate iron wolf rotational drives well they also have mm. ssds and the ssds the iron wolf ssds i've got two of them in one of my disk stations now so i have a read write cache on that and uh it's a you know they're 240 gig drives they do about 500 megabytes a second in terms of reads uh, and writes on the uh, 240 gig are about the same. Uh, sorry, writes on the larger drives are about the same. Writes on the 240 gig are, are like two half of that, like 250 megabytes a second. But on if you get the 500 gig or the one terabyte or, or even the two terabyte Iron Wolf, those are about 500 megabytes a second reads. But um, 
really like I've been really impressed with those. And of course, they're Iron Wolf drives. So, you know, the system knows about them and can do all those cool things. If your disk station is capable uh, and not all of them are, but if your disk station is capable, the um, some new disk stations like yours and mine, John, the uh, the I have the DS 20, uh, 1019 plus you have the DS 918 plus essentially identical with one drive bay difference. Um, they mm-hmm. have. M.2 NVMe slots on the bottom. They've got two of these built for an SSD. Yeah. And and that way you don't have to use a drive bay. You just pop one of these things in. And I've been testing one of those with a, this new SSD. It's it's actually built to be a like a high performance. So is it, it so oh, is ahead. this a cache or is it a full drive? No, it's a, it's treated as a cache by the system. You configure it as a cache and it cannot be okay. a full drive. Yep. Uh, but I put one of these okay, in. But no, I get that because of, go, go and then oh. I'll go. Okay, yeah. So I'm look, using this. Well, well, no. The thing I, I wanted to add is that the 713 that I have, even that, I have a OCZ um, SSD set up as an SSD cache. And, right. Uh, I mean, they show you all these stats, and the thing is, I I I'm pretty convinced that it's the even though it's an older system. I mean, 2013. Yeah. But having the ability and DSM is really good about this is that DSM is like, Oh, okay. You got an SSD here. You want to make it a cache? And I'm like, yeah. Yeah. And it really speeds things up. And as you're pointing out, you can see it from the, uh, you know, the performance uh, from the resource monitor. Yeah. DSM offers. Yeah. Yes. No, this one that I'm using in the, in the, in the, the disk station that the NVMe M.2 SSD cache is this new one from this company called Asura, A-S-U-R-A. It's their Genesis Extreme mm-hmm. that they sent me to test. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's I mean, it's it's super fast, like it like thirty four hundred megabytes a second reads and almost the same <laughs> speed in writes. Yeah. Yeah. Thousands of megabytes. Right. It's smoking fast. It re- and it really makes a difference. It it's cooking in there. It there it comes with this crazy like heat sink around it. I had to take that off because it wouldn't fit in the Synology without it. But but it's <laughs> it's cooled enough that that doesn't matter in the Synology. It's more for if you're putting it on like a motherboard or something. So yeah, but um, but yeah. Anyway, so so there you go. Uh, Steve had a a very related. So hopefully that helps, Mike. Um, Steve had a very related and very quick question. He said, uh, Dave, you recently talked about the migration of your NAS data, which I've now finally completed. Yes. Uh, but in that same podcast, I kind of heard you say that you no longer had the DS 18, 15 plus, but if my memory is okay, it was the DS 10, 19 plus I have the 15, 15 plus, and it's not always satisfied with video encoding to my Apple TV. Um, I'd like your inputs on my options. So yes, I have upgraded to the disc, the, the one of the very latest ones, which is the DS 1019 plus it is uh, it only has, I say only it has five drive bays. My, my DS 1817 plus, which is effectively the same thing as the 1815, like CPU wise there, it's the same and, and all that. Um, it has eight bays, which is, which is nice, but the 1019 plus has a CPU that has a hardware transcoding engine in it. In fact, it's, as I said before, the exact same P- CPU that you have, John, in your 918 plus. And it's amazing. Uh, having moved everything over, I'll start a Plex movie or something and see it needing to transcode because Plex will tell you. And Plex will tell you, oh, yeah, I'm using the hardware transcoder. And you look at the CPU on the disk station and it's just like cruising along. No problem. So, yeah, it makes a big difference having a hardware transcoding engine in there. I, I highly recommend it. So, yeah, it's good stuff. So, yes. And I do still have the 1817 plus. Um, and and I, I've been using that as my backup destination. So, yeah, it's a it's a charmed life I lead, but it's good. So, yeah. Any thoughts on any of this, John? You you I'm charmed. You're charmed. Yeah. Everybody's charmed. You've been moving a lot of your stuff over to the 918 as well, right? Well, I did that per your suggestion. I don't think I have. I, I've never had a streaming issue when I do the Synology DS video program yeah. Yeah, to my yeah, Apple yeah. TV. Yeah. But just to free up space, I did it. And the, the only thing that it taught me, and we'll probably 
probably talk about it in a future show, is that I saw the throughput when I was copying it from one Synology to the other, and it was over 100 megabytes a second, which means the bonding worked. The Ethernet bonding worked. (laughs) It's true. Listener Bill actually chimed in on that. Um, Because we talked about, all right, I casually mentioned that uh, the Ethernet bonding in the previous episode. And he says uh, what Dave did not say is that this Ethernet bonding does not happen automatically. If you just plug in the two ports, you'll get two Ethernet addresses, two IP addresses for the NAS and no speed increase at all. You must manually set the ports to bond. And uh, he sent us a, a, you know, Synology's article about that. But he's right. You got to go into control panel. I think he's kind of right. Oh, no, he's definitely right. You have to bond them together. It won't happen automatically. Well, no, you you, you have to. But but uh, my question to you is that. So, for example, Dave, in my situation, I have two different bonding scenarios. I have one where I actually had to set up my T, uh, TP-Link switch to do this wacky bonding protocol sure with my switch right but then with my other synology they have another option that says hey you know what choose this option don't and you don't have to switch. yeah so i have a blend of the two but because they're blended i was able to get over 100 megabytes a second right. which yeah so on the one where you set your death. switch up to bond them you didn't need to set the synology to bond but where the switch couldn't then you then you set the synology well That's i did fair. no i did so synology when you when you go to network and configuration they're like all right how do you want to bond these and it's like do you want to use this kind of protocol agnostic thing where we'll right. figure it out and you don't have to set up your switch. And then the other one is, well, you got to set up your switch for 802. Dot, it's some protocol. And you know, Right. Can, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So Synology is smart enough with their new. Uh, but, but here's the weird thing, Dave, is that the screen, the configuration screen on my newer Synology running the same version of DSM was different from my older one. Huh. It offered selections, but the wording was different. So, so you're talking about uh, IEEE 802.3 AD, which is otherwise known as I link, believe yes, link yes aggregation. So that is yeah. so that is the protocol where you have to set up your switch, right? Um, to understand that, and then the Synology will talk to it using that language. But then Synology all also offers a kind of protocol agnostic thing where they just kind of figure out how to do that without right. you having to set up your switch That's so right. yeah exactly yeah yeah yeah. but all i'm saying is dude when i saw over 100 megabytes a second throughput oh yeah yeah if the, you uh, if you've got the, the synology CPU tool and and you're doing big I was files, like yeehaw yeah like movies or whatever you can go like i saw over 150 it was yeah it was smoking it's good it's fun it's you know it's data with the new uh 10 megs with the new 10 meg machines 10 gig uh, who 10 knows gig. where we can go 10, 10 gig, gig i'm sorry yeah, yeah. 10 meg what am i talking about here all right That's folks like yesteryear. Hmm. thank you so much for listening we already told you the email address we already asked you to leave us reviews that's enough we don't need to ask you anything else that's you you've done enough just send us your no? questions how about that's the good. phone number nope the we've, phone do- number? we've done enough nope. they've done enough we've asked enough so we're not going to tell them that they can call us at 206-666-GEEK, Dave. No, because that phone number doesn't work anymore. That hasn't worked in years. What? So we have to, if, no, no, if they're going to dial the, the phone, wrong. it's 224-888-GEEK. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, so don't use the 206. 224. That. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> Cashfly, I would like to thank, because they provide all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. Of course, I want to thank... Uh, well, all of you for listening. I want to thank our sponsors, Clear at clearme.com slash MGG. Smile at smilesoftware.com slash podcast. Otherworld Computing at maxsales.com. Barebones Software at barebones.com. And Eero at Eero, E-E-R-O dot com slash MGG. Hope you have a good week, folks. We will see you in a week. Send us your questions. Send us your tips. And please...
no matter what you do, don't get caught. Made up.